So we're looking, aren't we, at strategies for how do we create the change that we need to have homeopathy fully accepted and re-accepted in countries um, that have really pushed out homeopathy in so many ways. What's lovely about this audience is it's very global, so the relationship with homeopathy is very different in different countries. But certainly in the UK, uh, after many years of fighting, we uh, lost our public funding at the end of March. And in anticipation of the loss of that public funding, about five years ago, I set up a new center for integrative medicine. And I think what's important is to be constantly looking at how we can reshape and reform and yet at the same time hold homeopathy in the frame. So integrative medicine is about how do we bring things together. And it's a term that I like. Um, it comes over from America. Andy Vile in the Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine set up this definition is how do you bring conventional and lifestyle and scientific and holistic approaches together. And by doing this, we lift our patients out of the crossfire and create an and rather than an or. And I hear in my clinics regularly people describing being in this crossfire. I can't tell my oncologist that I'm using Iskador and I can't tell my homeopath that I'm using steroids. Um, so, you know, it runs both ways and I think that as we create change, we really need to look at how to collaborate and understand each other. But crucially for me, integrative medicine is an empowered model. It is where the patient sits at the heart and their choices are supported and respected. Because remember, we're having a big scientific debate. We need to be really knowledgeable about the science. But when I say to my patients who are feeling a lot better, um, would, it, would it matter to you if this was a placebo or self-healing response? They say, I do not care. I was suffering and now I'm not. And I'm delighted um, to get well with whatever approach might help me. So I like this image because there's a clinician there talking to their patient, but also connecting them to lifestyle, nutrition, holistic approaches, acupuncture, homeopathy. And the other thing about integrative medicine is what underpins it is a wellness model. So a lot of the biomedical training is actually an illness model. We are taught to recognize pathology. We are taught to diagnose, and obviously that's a really, really important thing to do. But what we are rarely encouraged to do is to activate and create wellness. And it is the public who are creating this movement for change. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to be part of it. I don't know whether you can see, but you know, mopping up uh, the tap uh, rather than switching off the tap uh, seems very illogical. And yet a lot of the time that's what we're doing. It's almost like we ignore the early warning signs. We say, go away, all is well. There's no problems with your blood tests. But actually, the person feels that they are getting out of balance. And in order to create this movement for change, we have developed and now delivered a two-year diploma in integrative medicine. And we have our first graduates this October as part of the National Center for Integrative Medicine. And we really are excited about this diploma. This is part of the online learning, and we have included about 18 approaches relating to a range of conditions, and homeopathy is in there. I do want to say that it was very difficult for me as a medical homeopath to be developing this diploma. Lots of people wanted it not to be me, not to be our organization because of homeopathy. Um, but luckily, we were able to push through and press through. And one of the things that's really wonderful is within the diploma, we, I am 704, as it's called, is a module around critical analysis. So with our diploma students who are doctors, this year intake, we've had doctors from the Lebanon, from Germany, from Britain, uh, from 
or you name it, Portugal, mainly European because in America the Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine is delivering good education. But what is really, really exciting is to find that they have been longing to train in holistic modeling for a long time, but there hasn't been anywhere around for them to do that. One thing I noticed, again, as I kind of opened up to diversity, was just starting to look at what kind of underpinned a lot of holistic approaches. And I realized that balance and wholeness and rejuvenation, these are kind of key elements within a holistic model. And I put the yin-yang symbol there of balance. But drawing on other philosophies of health is also the way that we respect other traditions and other nations. But crucially, a lot of holistic approaches register when the body is getting out of balance. It's like driving a VW down the motorway, which we know isn't that reliable anyway, but then when the red light comes up on the dashboard, we get a crowbar and just smash the red light and carry on driving. And then we wonder why we break down just as we're getting to Cornwall. So um, a lot of our patients get that and want to look at things early. So why is homeopathy such a great integrative medicine intervention? Um, it empowers the individual. Fundamental is the idea the body is wise. If we listen, get out of the way, we'll often allow that person to connect and tell us what they're needing. It has healing and wholeness. Hahnemann wrote beautifully about models of health and healing and balance. And it has a direct connection to nature. I mean, that's the beauty of it. It might be a mineral, it might be an animal or a plant remedy, but we are directly connecting our human experience to nature. And it is safe and environmentally friendly. And these are really important things globally for us. It was Wessex Water in Bristol who did a wonderful study finding out that there were large quantities of Prozac in the water and they were able to identify a particular house. So they went and knocked on the door and said, look, I hope you don't mind, but we're noticing there's a lot of antidepressant coming out of your water. And, and the, this person said, well, my doctor keeps on prescribing the antidepressant and I don't want to take it. So I take it a, a month's supply and I flush it down the toilet. <laughs> but, you know, that's a great, uh, you know, uh, anecdote to reflect that we're getting it wrong. If we haven't understood that person doesn't want an antidepressant, then we're getting it wrong. And the thing is that there are some people who want it, benefit from antidepressants. And that's the beauty of integrative medicine. You are really individualizing. And it's also very, very safe, so it combines well with conventional uh, medicines. And a lot, over the years, by the way, my background is in palliative care, cancer care, symptom control, and a lot of oncologists and surgeons and breast care nurses sent their patients because they might not believe in homeopathy, but they knew I helped, and they knew that my medicines wouldn't interfere with their chemo agents. So, you know, there's so much here that uh, can work. Now, this is a busy slide, but I did want to just talk about uh, how I believe the, 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 the research strategy could move, and I'm, I'm sure you know, lots of people would have ideas. But in the early work that I did, I did a lot of observational studies, and it's so important that we give ourselves time to observe the phenomena of health and healing that we're observing. We've been put under huge pressure by the skeptics to be doing randomized control trials. I love placebo control trials, by the way. I just think they're such an elegant way to test something out. But we have to apply the right research design for the hypothesis. And we can't create a hypothesis until we've got some experience of what we think is important. And um, it was Working with 100 cancer patients initially in my observational work in Glasgow Homeopathic Hospital, as it was then, that allowed me to see that there was a subgroup of women with breast cancer and hot flushes who couldn't take HRT, who were coming very frequently. And so with my second observational study, I just focused on that. 
And then eventually, I then did a, a, a randomized placebo control trial, still at a fairly early age uh, in terms of my experience as a homeopathic physician. Um, my very first audit, I, I prescribed, I was quite amazed by this, always audit your work. I had prescribed Pulsatilla 60% of the time. Um, and I realized it was the only remedy I'd never taken myself. So I was seeing pulsatilla everywhere. Um, but I think, you know, that quality of reflection is crucial. But anyway, this randomized control trial taught me a huge amount about uh, the design of trials. And it was a negative trial. And it was a trial of individualized homeopathy. So everybody got a consultation, and then they were randomized either to a dummy medicine or to a real medicine. And the difference between groups was non-significant. And the hypothesis that I had was the homeopathic approach is a potent intervention for change. Both groups may improve because of the therapeutic nature of the consultation, and there may be a small but demonstrable advantage for those women having the consultation plus Viram. But what I hadn't understood, and again, this is me filtering through my life experience, in other words, believing that my homeopathic clinical practice is useful, is that I hadn't realized the nature of the placebo response. And um, I want to just talk a little bit more about that in terms of maybe our strategy for going forward. But I used uh, Measure Yourself Medical Outcome Profile and the treatment effect was 0 0.4. Remember, this is a, a seven-point score, my MOP, a bother score, essentially. Zero is the symptoms don't bother me. Six is it bothers me a lot. And I'm going to talk about a, a recent study that's been published that used this data from our trial. They were very bold. They said, well, um, we're going to have a treatment effect of 1.4, which is, you know, really, really interesting, and it is a positive trial, and I'll, I'll show you some data. But I wanted to mention Jennifer Jacobs, who's made a huge contribution uh, to uh, research trials. One of the things that I felt Jennifer really understood, she did a lot of studies in acute illnesses. And again, our strategy, I'm going to suggest that our strategy should be around research programs and I'm focusing on women's health within this talk, just to make the point about how when we start to focus on one area, we can begin to build data that then could be more, um, more informative. You know, we, we've, we've tussled with all of these meta-analyses that put everything together, but we want to get to the stage where we've got enough data within clinical conditions or certainly within clinical areas. And Jennifer's study was uh, really interesting. It was funded by the army who wanted to get their female um, recruits back into action after breast cancer. And they were randomized to three groups, either an individual, uh, individualized homeopathic remedy, a homeopathic combination medicine, which I'll mention, or placebo. And I think this was a great trial design because we really have to understand the difference between individualized homeopathy, which has lots of complex, what we call context effects, and um, where we try and remove some of those context effects by giving everybody the same medicine. They had a very long study period. Um, people were seen uh, every two months for a year, which when you're on a homeopathic complex is a long time. And these were the, this is Highland, I think we've got the Highland team here, haven't we? But the Highland menopause drops have been sold for over 50 years. And it's really very clever because it's got um, a mineral, amyl nitrate, one of the hydrocarbons so helpful for menopausal hot flushes. Sanguinaria, which is one of the lovely Papaveraceae family. So a plant remedy and an animal remedy. So we're really covering our kingdoms with this uh, wonderful combination. But can anyone guess what the side effect of taking that for a year was? <coughs> headaches, yeah, headaches. So there was a significant difference uh, I always like to connect to nature. This is the beautiful blood root. 
I have to say this is a popper uh, used to enhance uh, sexual uh, excitement um, in the uh, yeah in the dance arena, and this is lachesis. Uh, so these are these fabulous remedies, but sanguinaria particularly am uh, and amyl nitrate both have headache within their um, symptom picture. So what Jennifer Jacobs found was that there was evidence of a homeopathic drug proving. And I remember, you know, when uh, the good old days when Edzard Ernst ran his conferences in, um, in uh, Exeter, why he wasn't interested in the difference between those three groups. Uh, because that was a high quality randomized controlled trial showing that you had um, side effects from taking homeopathic medicines. As a researcher, you've got to be curious about that, even though that study was, again, if you like, negative. Um, but it did show quality of life improving in the um, individualized homeopathic group. So there were elements of it that were positive. So if we start to look at just an area um, of um, a clinical condition. I haven't mentioned the study that um, Rachel mentioned earlier, a beautiful study looking at uh, mood disturbance from Mexico that was presented at the last conference, but again, a really positive trial. And um, that wasn't mentioned in this review because this was 2015. Um, but this review did say there's observational data that shows that uh, homeopathy can help in the menopause, but no trial data at the moment that can recommend it. And yet this is an absolute key area that we know we can uh, help. So it's important to repeat trials. So I was hugely excited when homeopathy came through the post um, to see this new um, trial that's come out from Brazil. Looking at capsicum, uh, one of the Solanacea family, and I'll, I'll show you a picture of that. And it's a phase two randomized control trial, an exploratory trial. But again, they were very brave because they decided, rather than to use uh, capsicum, they would use uh, a, a relative known in the area. Um, and they decided to just launch into a trial using, preparing and using that plant which if I was kind of a, a, um, a researcher advisor, I'd be saying, look, put that into a case series first because you don't actually know whether it's going to be positive. Luckily, it was. So in terms of development of uh, the framework for design and evaluation, we're looking here at phase two, an exploratory trial. And we really do need a phase three trial. And this is why a program of research in a particular area can be so useful because within any single trial, you may just answer one little question uh, within a whole series of questions. So the research is very well laid out. Their hypothesis was that in menopausal women, the homeopathic medicine Malagueta, which they prepare, prepared as a 30 CH compared will, with placebo will significantly reduce the intensity of hot flashes. And they base that in that if you eat the plant, uh, even men in the room will get a hot flush. Um, and so they decide this would be uh, a beautiful law of similars. And they use the MIMOP, and again, I think it's great that they went back to our study and said, oh, look, they, had a, they use MIMOP. They had this difference, this treatment effect. We're going to build on that. Uh, and it's so important for us as researchers within the community to build on what's gone uh, before. What was interesting is because they chose a big treatment effect of 1.4, the power calculation suggested they only needed a total of 40 women. Now, I'm programmed to think that big trials are good and small trials are not good, but this treatment effect is absolutely crucial because you might not need a lot of people in your study if your treatment effect is big. Uh, by the way, MIMOP is 0.8, a minimally, uh, minimum clinically relevant um, movement on that scale, that ordinal scale. So the good thing is they decided we're really going to show improvement. But remember what's curious for me as a classical homeopath is that um, the researchers gave everybody the same medicine. 
which is this lovely medicine. Um, and remember when I showed you my trial at the beginning, I don't know whether you caught the picture of belladonna. So belladonna is a well-known menopause remedy. Uh, and it's again part of the Solanacea family. Suddenness, heat, fear, anxiety, these are all things that come through the Solanacea family. And this is Capsicum frutescens. And what they basically showed was a really nice p-value between the two groups. The intensity of hot flushes assessed by MIMOP was superior to that of placebo. And what's great for me within the diploma is that within the critical analysis, I can actually uh, encourage the diploma students to look at this research. And what I'm finding is that the diploma students are coming to me and saying, we didn't know there was any evidence for homeopathy. We were actively told there was no evidence. And yet you're showing us really interesting evidence. Um, so it's not surprising that some of the diploma students are now choosing to train in homeopathy. Because in terms of safety, particularly as a conventional doctor working to bridge across the communities, uh, we know that our treatments can be very safe. So Capiscum annum, which I, my understanding is these are very close relatives. And this is the symptom picture, menopausal disturbances with the burning of the tip of the tongue. If a woman with menopause mentions that, do, uh, you know, just give a, give a capsicum. Because in all my time of uh, specialising in this area, no one's ever said that to me, so I'm quite excited if anybody does. And I just wanted to mention some of the research that's been done in endometriosis and premenstrual syndrome with this idea of gathering together a program that might focus around women's health. What I would absolutely love is a chair of integrative medicine within the UK uh, and within that uh, professorial unit uh, to include high quality homeopathic research. I believe this is the way forward. Um, and I, I really believe that the better we know our data, the more we can clearly communicate that. Because again, there's been fabulous research done in the past that we can learn from. Uh, Mikhail Yakia, who's now actually transforming clinical um, practice with her wonderful book of the plants uh, that I use every day um, in, my, in my practice, she did a very elegant study of premenstrual syndrome because one of the problems when you have a consultation is that you create therapeutic or placebo effects. I remember in my trial, um, one woman who came to me, uh, she had developed breast cancer soon after the death of her husband and was in a very deep grief state. And I gave her graphitis and she had no improvement in her hot flushes at all but had curiously developed uh, a dry eruption in her eyebrows, which I then looked at in the repertory, and there was Natrum muriaticum, black type, and I thought, bingo, of course, this is Natrum muriaticum. Gave it to her, she came back within the trial, a new woman. My GP says, I'm a new woman. I am a new woman. Um, and when we broke the code, she was on placebo. Very, very difficult for me as a researcher. Didn't want to accept it. Di didn't want to accept it. And interestingly, she felt duped. Very, very interesting. She, she didn't feel, oh, I've got, I've got well on my own through a, a system of self-healing. She felt that I had somehow duped her, and we had to really work on, on how to manage that emotional state for her. So these are complex things. But what Mikal did was she worked out a group of remedies that she could see from her observational work were good in premenstrual syndrome, like Natrum muriaticum, like Lachesis, like Pulsatilla, like Sepia. But then she created questionnaires, symptom clusters, where you had to uh, tick all the boxes to be randomized to either Virum or the real thing. So what she did there was she was avoiding the consultation and trying to clearly identify who might benefit from those remedies. There's sepia, a very beautiful friend of mine, uh, personally. You know, I've benefited from that. I had Graves' disease after the birth of my second child. And um, 
the, 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 the consultant was amazed that I was able to come off propyl thiouracillin 10 months. But every time he said, well, what, are you, what, what medicine are you on? I said, well, I'm taking sepia. He said, no, 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 just, just the conventional medicine. So anyway, beautiful. Pulsatilla, another wonderful remedy premenstrually. So the other study that I wanted to mention, because I'm really interested in this, is potentized estrogen, so for endometriosis, because what we're understanding is that endometriosis is an estrogen dominant condition. There's often too much estrogen. And this was a study by Taxira, hopefully I've said that right, uh, that used homeopathic estrogen. One of the things I'm working with at the moment, and I would only want to do a case series on this, is the use of FSH, homeopathic FSH, to switch off the menopause drive. You know, because the problem is the hypothalamus is shouting to the ovaries, ovulate, ovulate, and the ovaries are shouting, I can't anymore. And FSH is shouting, get on with it, ovulate. And there, this struggle emerges. So we see very high FSH. And I have seen in that context women with inflamed ligaments, inflamed um, uh, tendons, and sleep disturbance and mood disturbance. So if any of you are interested just to um, experiment with this, is using FSH to try and switch off uh, that dynamic that people can get stuck in. Obviously, it's not just a physical thing. It's also about how do you let go? How do you let go into a new uh, transition? And I recently wrote a blog about um, the menopause as a creative transition. Um, having gone on GP update to see my only option was HRT. And not that it's not a struggle, um, but it's a struggle that we really want to support people if they can to uh, stay off HRT because of some of the side effects. But not if they can't, and maybe short term is important. But this was a, a really interesting study. They had 50 women aged 18 to 45. Uh, they based their diagnosis on MRI, transvaginal ultrasound, and they used potentized estrogen in uh, increasing doses or placebo. And these are, you know, high quality um, bits, of, uh, bits of research. Um, and pulling that together also gives us ideas, as it did for me, for the future about, because you see, the beauty of this is that you don't have to take a consultation, a homeopathic consultation, and induce healing and placebo effects. You can just understand that endometriosis is estrogen dominant and give a homeopathic medicine to try and create a rebalancing response, which in itself is fascinating. So I want to leave time for questions and just a few more slides to say that I truly believe the tide is turning. Integrative medicine is popping up all over the world. Uh, as I was setting up the diploma, I got an email from a, a GP and friend who said, he actually said, give up. No one wants a diploma in integrative medicine. <laughs> um, you, you have to just, these people have to be grist to the pearl in the oyster, you know, because, and, but he made me doubt. And now what's wonderful is we, with our new intake, is just speaking to doctor after doctor, healthcare professional, pharmacist, nurse, radiographer, saying, this is the way I want to work. This is, this is the future. Um, and there is an integrative medicine conference at the end of um, this month. Uh, and it's, um, it's the Israeli team who I haven't met yet, but I'm going along to talk about the diploma. So just finally, how do we take the agenda forward? We do need to prioritize trials that are most relevant to healthcare because we've got to remember that our, our patients really value homeopathy, but they do need us to help them continue to be able to access it. And don't be afraid to spend time developing observational data. If, if we can get a very active team together, then often that can speed up the process. But working with a very clear hypothesis is important. And then, of course, once you've got your hypothesis, it won't be clear which trial design to use. And do, do really open yourself up to the range of trial designs that are out there. Don't feel forced to do a placebo control trial. And understanding the placebo and non-local effects. 
Um, my thesis was uh, around this area. And don't forget there are things like expectation, conditioning effects. A beautiful study where people are given chemotherapy, pink, they make it pink, and they see their white cells um, decrease. The following three weeks, they then give the chemo. It's pink, but it's not chemo. It's a placebo, and their white cells drop. Those are what we feel are conditioning uh, responses, uh, but the human mind is, is a fascinating thing. The other thing is meaning making. You know, what is the meaning that occurs during a long consultation? And also we mustn't f forget the nurture effect. Yesterday we were talking about the Hawthorne effect. What happens when people come into a trial? They get cared for, they get loved. They get appreciated. These are very powerful uh, stimuli to the, to the human body, usually with the release of oxytocin. And uh, the professor of um, CAM in Exeter, the new one, by the way, uh, although he's just retired, which is a shame, but his whole thesis was around the nurture effect and the kind of healing that you see in uh, various settings. So understanding that is important. Understanding what we do, um, applying appropriate research methodology, understanding the complexity um, of our intervention, and also focusing where conventional options are limited or causing unacceptable side effects. And crucially, our research should focus around cost because we can save money, large amounts. Thank you. Uh, sorry, sorry, just to say, I, I forgot to say that we do want to let you know that we're um, leading on, on the uh, European Congress for Integrative Medicine. Please put it in your dates, September 2020, but also put in abstracts for homeopathy. Let it really shine within an Integrative Medicine Congress, because then all your colleagues, you can network with them, yeah?